Okay, good morning and welcome to the 28th meeting of the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee in 2017. Could I ask everybody in the public gallery to switch off their electronic devices or at least switch them to silent so they don't interfere with the work of the committee? Can I welcome Tavish Scott, MSP, who's joining us for this morning's meeting? Um, and can I ask the committee, item one is um, a, an agreement to take item three in private. Are we so agreed? Thank you very much. And can I move us on to item two? And we'll now take evidence on the Auditor General's report on Transport Scotland's ferry services. And I welcome Fraser McKinley, Director of Performance, Audit and Best Value, um, Graham Greenhill, Senior Manager of Audit Scotland. Could I invite an opening statement from Fraser McKinley? Thank you, Convener. Good morning, members. Um, so I'm delighted to bring uh, the Auditor General report today, uh, which reviews Transport Scotland's subsidised ferry services. Uh, I'll summarise the findings under three headings. Um, first of all, the uh, assessment we make of Transport Scotland spending uh, on ferries, including what this has achieved. Secondly, on uh, our observations on long-term planning. And finally, the recent procurement of the Clyde and Hebridean Ferry Service, which is one of Transport Scotland's largest operating contracts. First of all, convener, we absolutely recognise that ferries are an essential part of Scotland's transport network providing lifeline services for many island communities across Scotland. The team uh, visited 10 uh, such communities in the course of the audit, and we absolutely recognise the importance of these services to those communities, both on islands and indeed uh, on the mainland. Um, and it's in that context that we look at the spending and performance, first of all, um, which, as the report points out, um, has increased uh, Transport Scotland spending on ferry services and assets has more than doubled in the last nine years, now to over £209 million in 2016-17. This is mainly down to a 185% increase in spending on the Clyde and Hebridean contract, primarily due to an increase in the number of services, new boats, and the impact of the road equivalent tariff, uh, which has significantly reduced the cost of ferry travel for uh, communities and tourists. Despite the overall increase in ferry spending, Transport Scotland does not routinely measure the contribution that ferry services make to social and economic outcomes. In the context of tightening public sector budgets and given the vital nature of these services, we recommend in the report that Transport Scotland considers ways to measure the impact of ferry services which should help it to demonstrate whether its spending represents value for money. Overall, though, it's important to stress that we found that Transport Scotland's ferry operators are performing well. 99% um, of services run on time and communities uh, or, who use the services are generally happy. However, despite numerous forums being in place for Transport Scotland and others to communicate with ferry users, it was clear from our visits to those communities that many people do not understand how the ferry system, uh, how ferries uh, operate in Scotland. And on this point, we recommend that Transport Scotland, along with the relevant partners, better communicate the various roles and responsibilities. Turning now, convener, to the, our points about long-term planning for ferry services and assets, Transport Scotland has made significant progress in delivering its current 10-year ferries plan, which runs up until 2022. While this is a good achievement, the plan focuses primarily on the Clyde and Hebridean network. There are many additional planned developments for ferries across the rest of Scotland. But the full cost of these developments is unclear, as is the full cost of harbour improvements which are likely to be required in the future. So we've recommended that Transport Scotland develop a new long-term strategy uh, for its Scotland-wide network of subsidised ferries. This should take into account the significant progress against the current ferries plan, plus the planned developments into the future. The new strategy should help it determine um, and, importantly, prioritise future investment in services and assets. And finally, convener, turning to procurement. The new Clyde and Hebridean ferry services contract started on time in October 2016, although we have identified some weaknesses in how Transport Scotland managed the procurement project. This included delays in, in appointing some important staff, preparing business cases and providing bidders with information. Bidders were not always clear what was expected of them and, and they submitted over 800 queries during the process. So we make a number of recommendations to help Transport Scotland improve its approach to ferry procurement and contract management, including ensuring that it has the right people with the right expertise in place and uh, we expect Transport Scotland to pick those lessons up uh, as part of the ongoing review of procurement policy for ferries. Uh, convener, as always, Graeme and I are very happy to answer any questions. If there's any um, questions that we uh, struggle to answer today, we will, of course, write back to you uh, just as soon as we can. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Mr McKinley. I wonder whether I could kick off um, the questioning. Um, you talked about a Scotland-wide network of subsidised ferries. Um, I'm sure you'll, you'll appreciate that SPT run one ferry service, Kilcreggan to Gourock. Um, the Scottish Government has agreed in principle to take that over. Um, do you see anything that would stop that from happening, or do you think there are synergies in doing so because it would fit within a wider ferry network? Thank you, Convener. Um, yes, I mean, I guess the first thing to say is we didn't specifically look at that route, nor uh, some of the routes that were provided by councils or private sector con uh, providers as part of this uh, report, because we were focusing on Transport Scotland ones. But we are aware of the issues in uh, Gourick, Kilcreg and Ferry, and it does seem to me that the discussions that are ongoing make absolute sense to see whether SPT continuing to provide that service is indeed uh, the best way forward. I would, I would imagine that the government will want to uh, look at that specific issue in the context of uh, both the procurement review that's currently ongoing, but it's also, I think, a good example of why we think uh, the Government and Transport Scotland need to look at a longer-term ferries plan that looks at all ferry services rather than, than just a, a, a bit of the, the network convener, because it does seem to me that um, if there are some potential historical anomalies that have grown up over time, that's the opportunity to look at that again. Thank you, that's very helpful. Um, can I move us on to, to value for money? Because um, quite astonishing, the amount of investment in ferries has increased by something like 115% in real terms. And I think there are many government departments that would bite off your hand for that kind of increase. Yet passenger numbers have only increased by 0.3%. Um, so what kind of subs... Why, why is there this disparity? And should we be seeing more passenger numbers? And what is the level of subsidy that is therefore given to ferry passengers? Um, the conclusion we make, convener, on value for money is uh, towards the end of the report in part four, and, and where we got to is it's difficult to determine whether Transport Scotland spending on ferries is value for money. Now, that's not to say that the additional investment hasn't delivered stuff. It absolutely has. So there are new services. Um, there is the road equivalent tariff. There is new boats. There is There have been upgrades to... To harbour, so you can see tangible things that the money has been spent on. I suppose our challenge is, um, and you mentioned the passenger numbers as a good example, um, our challenge is how does the investment in those tangible things deliver improvements in terms of economy, in terms of economic growth, in terms of um, other social outcomes to the communities they're serving? And that's the bit that we think is, is missing in terms of the assessment and, uh, and reporting on that. Um, we do mention right at the end of the report uh, on paragraph uh, 122 that um, the Transport Scotland is beginning to develop a thing called policy assessment framework which is designed to do that and we would absolutely encourage uh, a degree of urgency with that because we do think, as you say, convener, it's unusual for us to do audit work and for this committee to look at areas of public services that has experienced this level of in increased investment um, uh, where the story in lots of other places is about contraction. So for that reason, we think it's really important that we redouble our efforts to demonstrate value for money for that spend. Are you able to provide a per passenger cost? Graham? Um, we have not done so, but I can certainly have a look at that. Um, it should, in theory, be possible, I would think. Uh, just to give a little bit of a flavour to uh, the numbers, the 115% increase that you spoke about, most of that uh, increase in spend uh, relates to the decline in Hebrides uh, ferry services, where um, the level of subsidy uh, increased by something like 185% over the, uh, the 10 years to 16-17. To um, and that's largely accounted for through uh, increases in services, uh, the introduction of new vessels, the introduction of uh, road equivalent tariff. Uh, and overall, if you look at 2016-17 uh, in isolation, of the £210 million, which, uh, £210 million pound which Transport Scotland uh, spent on ferry services in, in that year, 2016-17, 63% of that money was on subsidies to the Clyde and Hebrides, 16% uh, was in subsidies to the Northern Isle ferry services, 1% to Gurik Dunoon, 13% um, was on loans to uh, Caledonian Maritime Asset Limited to procure new vessels, and 7% was on grants for harbour improvement works. 
I think that kind of breakdown is helpful to understand, but you know, I, I'm interested in being able to compare different forms of public transport. So typically somebody told me that the per head passenger subsidy for a bus is 30 pence, yes. and clearly what we're seeing with ferries, although they are different forms of, of transport, is substantially yeah. greater. So it would be, I think, useful to have that ability to compare. I, I, I can, we can certainly do it for um, the likes of Clyde and Hebrides on a whole. Whether or not we can do it on a route by route basis, yeah. I'll need to go back and check. Okay. That would be very helpful information. Yeah, Liam, that, Liam first. Well, just on that specific point, but, because as well as per passenger, per passenger mile, if we're doing a comparison, would yep. be perhaps as helpful yes. as well. Okay, if that can be provided. Liam, care. Yeah, I just want to pick up on that point for me, because you say the, the CalMAC subsidy, I think, has doubled or has gone up by 185% over the last 10 years. Uh, my understanding is that passenger numbers have increased by 0.3%. Uh, now, if that's correct, that's an awful lot of money going towards not a great deal of equivalent in passengers. And there's a subsidiary thing that concerns me, because I think I'm right in saying that after the introduction of RET, car numbers increased by 16.8%. Uh, is there any assessment being done on the impact of the extra traffic on island communities and the cost to presumably the local authorities there on the roads infrastructure of this extra traffic but not the extra passengers? I'll, I'll ask Graham to come in on the, the, the second half of your point, Mr Kerr, about the, the valuation work that's been done in, in some places. But, but your point is, a cent is, I guess, our central point around demonstrating value for money. So. Um, so, as I say, you, the, absolutely, you can see things that have that have been bought and paid for by the additional investment, um, but with a 0.3% increase in passenger numbers, it does seem to me that it's it's the passengers that are going to be spending the money on islands and not the cars. Mm -hmm. So, um, it's interesting that the um, that the pattern um, that that we've seen is a significant increase in in cars and motorhomes and those other kinds of things. Um, what, what we don't have enough sense of across the piece, there have been some evaluation work done, but what we don't have a strong enough sense of is what is the actual impact then on, mm. uh, on growth, for example. But equally, um, there was a lot of coverage in the newspaper this, this summer, for example, about the impact on some, uh, on some communities about increased traffic and other things. That's a little bit anecdotal, maybe, but I think it is something that um, the uh, potential consequences of RET uh, is that we would encourage Transport Scotland to look at. Uh, and we know that they are looking at that in the context of the Northern Isles, where they are going to be reducing fares from 2018 uh, onwards. Graham, do you want to say anything about the evaluation? Um, yeah, uh, before moving on to that, um, just to clarify, you're, you're correct in saying that the 0.3% increase in um, uh, passenger numbers um, over the last 10 or so years, that actually, that's, that's a Scotland-wide increase. If you look at uh, Cal the um, Clyde and Hebrides in isolation, uh, the number of passengers uh, on those routes actually increased something like 7% uh, since 2006-07. Um, and as you see, um, a 16% uh, increase in uh, um, car numbers as, as well. Um, as Fraser said in his introductory remarks, um, part of the audit, we visited 10 different island communities and spoke to, to, to various representatives of their views of the ferry services. And um, one of the things that we spoke to them about, obviously the, the Clare and Hebrides people, uh, was about uh, the introduction of a road equivalent tariff. And um, there were some positive comments made, but equally, uh, some of the comments com coming back from the, the island communities were around these kind of issues that you rose. That, that, that you rose, um, you know, for example, um, in many ways, uh, the islanders were welcoming this in, in increased traffic numbers, increased visitors to the islands, but there were um, negative consequences as well. Um, for example, it was difficult sometimes to get on a ferry because they were full up mm -hmm. at peak times. Uh, but equally, they, they, they spoke about the impact on traffic congestion and um, road condition. Um, no work, as far as I'm aware, has been done to actually evaluate the precise impact of these things. 
Um, RET was introduced initially on a pilot basis on a number of um, um, routes, individual routes, uh, and it was, has subsequently been rolled out. 2016 was the first year in which RET was available on all of the Clyde and Hebrides uh, routes. So it's a little too early for an overall um, examination of the, 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 uh, the benefits which have accrued uh, um, as a result of introducing RET, but it's certainly something that we would be looking for Transport Scotland to, uh, to examine. Thank you. Colin Beattie. Thank you, um, There's several things I'd like to touch on here. I mean, this report seems to be like quite a few of the reports we've seen in recent times. OK at the moment, but pressures in the future. Um, and I'm looking at the pension scheme. Is that pension scheme still open? It is. It is. I mean, I find it quite eye-watering. In 2016, the employer's pension contribution rate has gone to 30.8%. Is there any other area of the public sector that's been able to go to that level of uh, contribution? So, so I wouldn't like to give you a categorical answer, uh, uh, Mr Beattie, but it does seem unusual. I don't, I don't think you find that... In, in many places. I, I do find it quite extraordinary because we have looked at this in different sectors of the public uh, area and uh, there's a consistent problem with pension fund deficits and we've sort of shrugged our shoulders and accepted that that's the way it is and sort itself out in the future, hopefully. But this, uh, I mean, this seems to be a very focused plan to eliminate the deficit by increasing contributions way above what the rest of the public sector is doing. It, has there been any justification for that, other, other than the simple fact of closing it? Why should they be out of step from the rest of them? So I'm not sure we can answer that specific question because it's 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 kind of out with our, our remit, I guess, Mr Beatty, to comment on the, the, the rights or wrongs of a particular pension scheme. The reason we talk about it in here is that it is absolutely one of the cost pressures that the service faces. Um, so it's not for us to, to suggest what they what they do about that, but we do absolutely recognise that it's a, a significant part of the cost pressures that uh, the funding for ferry services will face in the future, um, based on based on current plans. Graham, is there anything else you want to say about that? Um, I, I mean, uh, ultimately, the uh, the percentage contribution is um, informed by the value of the assets in the pension fund and the estimated liabilities of, uh, the, of the pension fund. And the increase in contribution rates was really introduced as a result of the, the scheme administrator's uh, recommendations. Um, clearly, if um, the investment returns from the assets uh, improve, then the scheme deficit is likely to reduce over time. But if that doesn't happen, uh, as the report says, then we think that you know, Transport Scotland will have to look at the pension scheme um, uh, and to see what uh, other options might be available for them. Now, it seems to be saying here that the pension fund trustees are driving this, which implies that uh, ultimately down the line, Transport Scotland has had no choice but to, to pay in. If that's the case here, why isn't it the case elsewhere in the public service? Um, so, so I don't think the process is any different. So trustees are the people who are responsible for um, ensuring that pension schemes are viable into the future, and and uh, the trustees of those schemes will then um, set policies, and, and employers will then pay accordingly. So I'm not I'm not sure unless Graham corrects me otherwise. I'm not sure the, the process is really that different. What I guess what is different is some of the numbers involved, Mr. Beatty. I guess that's that's the thing. But but in terms of the relationship between the trustees at the scheme and, and Transport Scotland, I'm not sure that's very different to the local government pension scheme or or, or any other. Uh, uh, Fraser's correct. Uh, the local government pension scheme contributions have risen uh, over the last few years. Uh, similarly, with uh, further education colleges, contribution rates have increased. Um, have they risen to this level? Not to that level, um, but perhaps, we, I mean, we, we haven't looked at the history, the full history of the pension scheme. Um, the fact that there, um, the deficit has arisen, um, it will have arisen over time. Um, I'm speculating 
but you know um, the the increase the recent increase in contribution rates is perhaps a function of a failure to address the deficit in earlier years. I'm speculating. I, I because, you know I, because, because we haven't looked at the history of the pension scheme. Just moving on to harbour dues. It seems that the harbours have two main sources of funds, which is the uh, basically a subsidy from Transport Scotland, grants from Transport Scotland, and then the harbour dues, which they charge the ferries. Do they have any other source of income? Well, these are working harbours. Um, many are run by harbour trusts, so they will levy dues on um, fishing boats, uh, pleasure craft, uh, and so forth. Do we know what sort of proportion that is? Because it seems to me that the bulk of the money here is coming from Transport Scotland one way or the other. We don't have that information, no. No. no we don't know, Mr Beatty. As I say, we've, we've really concentrated on the, the Transport Scotland bit of that. And because many of them, as Graham says, are either privately owned or in trusts, it's, you know, it, it would be hard for us to figure out what the proportion of that is. Well, looking at paragraph 31, it says Transport Scotland spent a total of £200 million on harbour dues between the contract years 2007-08 and 2015-16, of which £155 million was on harbours not owned by Seamal or Calmont. Um, and Transport Scotland doesn't know how much of the harbour dues paid to these harbour owners have been used for improvement works. Yeah. It doesn't yes, seem very satisfactory. <laughs> So it, I think I think the risk we're identifying there is the potential for almost paying twice. So so there are the harbour dues, and that and that um, is an entirely accepted part of the operating the business. But we also cite examples in here where Transport Scotland have invested quite significantly to upgrade harbours, um, uh, and and including harbours that they don't own, um, primarily to accommodate new vessels and, and new routes. Now I'm not suggesting that's a that's not a good thing to do. I think what we're saying is that um, as part of the long-term planning point, that needs to be considered more carefully in, in the future. And, and I think what that paragraph is saying is that um, it, it seems to us that it would be reasonable for Transport Scotland to have a, a stronger handle on what the money's being spent on in terms of upgrading the assets, even though they don't own them. But equally in that paragraph, you're noting that Transport Scotland not only funds upgrading of the of the non seamal harbours, but it's paying higher levels of harbour dues, which you would think would be part of the reinvestment back into these harbours. And so, and I, so they are paying twice. And and so I suppose our our question, our challenge question for Transport Scotland, Mr. BT, is that's that comes back to our point about value for money. That might be an entirely legitimate and good thing to do for all sorts of reasons. Um, I think. I think when we ask the question, it, it's, it doesn't seem to be something that's really that, that's you know at the forefront of their minds, and, and certainly we weren't we weren't able to find a good explanation for why that model works well. So I think that would be our our suggestion, our, our recommendation around that is is again to demonstrate the value for money of that spend. Well, still looking at value for money, one of the things which really surprised me was paragraph forty five or forty five and forty six forty six really which says the total amount of commercial vehicle travelling across all ferry routes is unknown. So we're happily measuring cars, but commercial vehicles, which must be significant. Same paragraph 46 does say that between 2007 and 16, the number of commercial vehicles travelling across CHFS routes decreased by 22%. I mean, how does this factor into, into, the, into their planning? Is there any evidence that this is being taken into account. Okay. And why uh, is it uh, dropping? It's, it, it, it is a weakness that we, we recognise. Um, we do think that Transport Scotland could uh, develop its information uh, to, to get a better handle on um, commercial um, freight traffic uh, to, to understand what has actually been carried. And if it were to do so, we believe that um, that, that would be um, at least a contribution to, to assist them to develop a better understanding of um, the value of the ferry services that they are subsidising. Well, that paragraph does emphasise the fact that uh, there's this drop of 22%, but 
you do say in the last sentence, in contrast, the number travelling on non-Transport Scotland subsidised routes increased by 16%. Why is that? Um, that could be a, a for um, due to a number of factors. Uh, I think one of the explaining factors is up to 2012, the Guruk Dunoon route also carried um, the Kalmak or um, Guruk Dunoon route also carried vehicles. Um, after that, after 2012, it went to passengers only. So there probably has been a transfer of vehicle traffic to um, Western Ferries, which is a, a private operator, uh, which operates uh, a little to the south of the Gurug Dunoon route. But again, you're kind of extrapolating that and, and, and speculating that that's the case. I would have expected that Transport Scotland would have had this information to their fingers because it's so important to the development of the routes. So, so, so the, core, the core point, Mr. Beatty, is exactly that. So that we. In paragraph 117, we set out what the ferries plan says that the funding of ferry services is designed to do. And there are four very straightforward and clear bullet points there. Our, our challenge is that they don't yet have the measurement frameworks in place to tell us whether or not those things are happening. So I think that's the, the, that section you're highlighting there is an mm. example of one of the bit, bits of data, one of the bits of performance measurement that we would argue that if, if, if the significant increase in investment, which is an entirely legitimate policy decision for government to make, is about increasing economic growth and all these other things, then we need better ways of measuring that, I think. Would, would you say, based on, based on the information that's to hand, that Transport Scotland have sufficient information at their fingertips to be able to um, drive in an appropriate way the investment and development of routes? We, we think that should be better developed, for sure. That, that I think, is, uh, in a sense, what we're trying to get at around the whole question of value for money in terms of the longer-term planning. Um, the ferries plan was, was a very good step, and they've made good progress on that. Um, a lot of that has been about <coughs> delivering vessels, upgrading assets, and that's all good. I'm not saying that's, they're not good things to have done. I think the next bit is then making the connection between that investment and what difference is it actually making to it to businesses and communities and, and people who, who travel on those routes day in, day out. OK, Liam Kerr. Thank you, Convener. Uh, just very quickly on something Colin Beatty said. Uh, you mentioned Western Ferries there, I think. Am I right in thinking Western Ferries doesn't get any subsidy? That's correct. That's correct. Right. Um, I would like to look at procurement, if I may. Section 3 of your uh, report. <coughs> And a key message two on page 32 uh, picks up, and Fraser McKinley picked up in his opening comments, that there were weaknesses in the, uh, I think you call it a CHIFS procurement exercise. Uh, Fraser McKinley alluded to 800 uh, queries that came in during the tendering process. Uh, and on page 33, uh, it seems that there was a previous contract, a previous CHIFS contract, that set out a number of learning points that hadn't been picked up uh, in this process. So my first question is, were there, and if so, what were the additional costs that arose, both financial and or non-financial, uh, resulting from the management of this procurement exercise? Uh, the cost being, the extra cost being to bidders, to the CHIF service, or Transport Scotland? Um, so, uh, I mean, I'll check with Graham, Mr Kerr, but I don't think we can give you a, an exact figures on those things. But we, but in speaking to the bidders, mm -hmm. they did say that um, it, it added cost to the process. It was not a, a straightforward bidding process. Mm -hmm. um, now, to be fair, the, one of the reasons that there were those level of queries was that the, the route, the procurement method that Transport Scotland decided to adopt was designed to encourage dialogue and, and a bit of to and fro between uh, Transport Scotland and the bidders. So you would expect a degree of that. Um, but there's no doubt that uh, we think that that seems significant um, in terms of the, the numbers of queries. Uh, speaking to the bidders, they said that they felt they were having to pull, pull together uh, their bids without some quite important information, um, which was difficult. Um, and so I think inevitably, certainly, what they told us was that was that 
added cost for them. Um, we, we can't, I don't think, say much about what additional costs it might have um, brought to Transport Scotland, but there's no doubt that it was a very involved process. Um, they did manage to get it done on time, but it did mean that, the, particularly towards the end of that process, it was, it was pretty tight. Isn't the problem here that this was, uh, I think uh, earlier on you mentioned this was a new process, uh, and one of, the, one of the things that concerns me is if the client, so in this case the Transport Scotland, the state, uh, how do I put this, isn't confident in what it's doing because it's a new process and is trying to put in place what we might call a novel contract, then the system is doomed to, to have problems. And the bidders, in this case the two bidders, will incur cost effectively whilst Transport Scotland, in this case, learns on the job. That doesn't strike me as very fair to those bidding for a contract. Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I mean, we, we, we touch on the, the chosen procurement method from, it's on page 37, and there's no doubt that at that point it was new, it was novel. I think Transport Scotland did it for the right reasons, which was to encourage dialogue. Um, but I think one of the points we make in the report is that given that actually quite a lot of the conditions of the contract are pretty well set in advance, um, the, uh, as, it's, as it's known, let me get this right, the competitive procedure with negotiation route is designed primarily, as I understand it, not a procurement expert, but designed um, for contracts where the requirements maybe aren't very clear and, and they're developed almost in a, in, a, in a kind of more collaborative process. So it seemed like a slightly odd fit given that a lot of the requirements of the contract were, were quite clear from, from early on. Um, so, I mean, to some extent, um, if you're trying something different, there's always a degree of learning. So, so I wouldn't want to be too critical of them per se for trying something different or innovative. Uh, I think they had good reasons for that at the time. I also think, as we set out in that in that bit of the report, it did also have some consequences about how that process went. But previously, <clears throat> so going back to my original question, uh, lessons hadn't been learned from the previous process, it would appear. Do you have any confidence that lessons have been learned uh, now? Uh, yes, I think we're more confident of that. And I think the couple of reasons are that we can see that Transport Scotland are taking steps to take a more strategic approach to procurement. So I think one of the points we make in the report is that it has been quite piecemeal in the past, that there have been people put on to uh, to run the procurement of a particular contract and they move on to something else. One of the points we make in this is that given the scale of some of this procurement, we think it's important that Transport Scotland take a more strategic approach to the procurement and contract monitoring of ferries across the board. That links to the, the, the longer term national planning point. Um, and we can see already that I think um, through the procurement review and other things that Transport Scotland are already making making some good steps in that direction. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll just drop off procurement for a second because I, I, you mentioned the learnings that are coming. Now, uh, you mentioned uh, at page 40 that there were, I think, 350 commitments made by CalMAC in their bid. But you then go on to say that Transport Scotland are not, have not assessed whether those 350 commitments have actually been met. Am I reading that correctly? Uh, nearly, I think I would say. So, so it's fair to say, um, Mr Kerr, this, this has been a, a, a point of some discussion with Transport Scotland because we because I think their argument is that because there was only one bidder, the compliant bidder, successful bidder in the end, that the there wasn't a requirement pre-contract, pre-award, to assess those those 350 commitments. So, so that's the point we're making in the report. It's not that those 350 commitments aren't being monitored because they are. Uh, Transport Scotland are confident that they are part of the contract and they'll be monitored. Uh, the delivery of those commitments will be monitored as part of the contract. So it's not that they're not being delivered. I think our point is that um, there wasn't any assessment of, of those 350 at the point of awarding the contract. Transport Scotland's argument is we didn't need to because by that point it was clear that there was only um, one compliant bid. I think argument, our argument would be uh, it, it would still have been helpful to have evaluated those commitments in terms of the value add that, that was going to, to be brought. And again, that's about our central point around measuring the impact of all of this, not just you know 
individually, but overall, what are we going to get for our money? Just again, a, a, a small side point, if I may, that uh, if there's only one compliant bid, and it, effectively the process results in only one party being competent to or in a position to deliver on a contract, then if that party bids, you'll, you'll give me the exact figures, but say 860 million for a contract, and then comes back knowing it's got the state over a barrel and says, actually, I need another 120 million added on top of this, uh, we're not in a terribly good position, are we? We have to give in to the, the extra demand that wasn't budgeted for. So, so we would always want as competitive a a market as possible, I guess, is the starting point. Um, but in this case, uh, I think Transport Sporting were clear that there was one compliant bid. They were clear that they, through through other work and other routes, were able to assess the value for money, the, the efficiency of the bid, the, the successful bid from CalMac. Um, and to be fair, the increase in the in the contract that, that subsequently came through had been known by everyone that was involved for some time because that was related to changes in timetables that everyone knew was coming. So. So I don't have a sense that the, the the situation you've described, which theoretically could happen, I don't get a sense that this is that's what's happened here. I think the the increase in the cost of the contract would have been an increase in the contract regardless of who was delivering it, because it was it was tied to changes in timetables and services. Effectively, and I think quite reasonably, Transport Scotland had to kind of um, draw a line in the sand at a point in time and say this is what the bid is, so that everyone's operating to the same. Uh, playing field and you couldn't continually change those but everyone then knew that once it comes into practice uh, into service that, that that was going to have to be on a bit final question uh, and I, I will come back on point now uh, on procurement is uh, my understanding is that at a general level there is no waiting for incumbency uh, and it, this troubles me because it, it seems to me that the only thing that incumbency will allow you to do is get from a long list into a short list to be considered for a, a, a future contract. Uh, if I'm right on that, where is the incentive on the incumbent operator, whether it be ferries, whether it be trains, whatever, to invest towards the end of that contract? And how confident are you that those new people who put the contract together in this case have sufficiently built in safeguards uh, or paybacks towards the end of any of these contracts such that the incumbent has to continue delivering right up to the end? It's, it's a great question, Mr Kerr, and I'm not sure I've thought about it, if I'm absolutely honest, so I would be, I would be speaking off the, off the top of uh, my head, which is always a dangerous thing to do. So, so can I take that away and think about it? Um, be really genuinely, because I think it's a very interesting point, not as you say, not just for this, but for all of our work across procurement. So we're very happy to take that away and, and, and have a think about it and come back to you. I'd be grateful. Thank you. Thank Tyler you. Scott the, 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 key part is the 150 commitments and, and our responsibility to monitor delivery of those commitments. Um, the question is, what is the consequence of, if some of those commitments are not delivered? Mm. But as Fraser says, it's a good question. Okay, Tavis Scott had a supplement. Thank you very much. I was just about to say I can think of an answer to that, but I'm no longer the Transport Minister, so um, I'm not going <laughs> to uh, try. Um, I wonder if I could ask one supplementary uh, convener. Um, is procurement, in Audit Scotland's view, value for money? Does it provide value for money for the taxpayer? In, in general terms? In gen on, on ferry contracts. On ferry contracts. Um, so... I think I think the conclusion we've reached, Mr. Scott, in the report is that it's it's not demonstrated clearly enough. But it would be on the Northern Isles ones, based on your case study four, where it shows that the subsidy that used to go to Calmac prior to the most recent award has been dra dramatic, dramatic, uh, dramatically re uh, reduced. It, it has, although although a good chunk of that reduction isn't directly related to the operation of the of the contract. So I think from from memory in the report, about a third of it we've we've attributed to what you might call efficiencies and changes to the service. Other things yeah. are a reduction in timetable and reduction in, sure. in the cost of fuel. So, and I, and I think I'm always a little bit um, cautious about making direct comparisons across the different Absolutely. routes because they are very different. Absolutely. Um, but what is clear. I guess, is that when you're procuring uh, these kind of services, which are hugely important to communities for this level of money, I think there is more they need to do to demonstrate the value for that money that's being spent. More than you need to do in terms of the procurement exercise? Well, no, I guess not so much 
on its own, but the procurement exercise as the vehicle through which yes. you get you get value for money in, in the delivery of the service. Yes. Yeah. But the alternative to procurement is for the government to just run them all. Ah, I see what you mean. So, um, so I I think regardless of whether there's a procurement exercise like this or not, our our challenge would always be to any public service you still need to demonstrate yeah. value for money. Yeah. And if you're not going through a a market procurement exercise, there has to be yeah, another absolutely. another vehicle for demonstrating value for money. Thank you. Monica Lennon. On a positive note, uh, the Audit Scotland report highlights that Transport Scotland has made significant progress against commitments in its, in its various plan to develop ferry services and assets um, between 2013 and 2022. So that's that's very good. That's welcome. However, I'm struck um, by the fact in the report that you're highlighting that it's very difficult to quantify future spending and there seems to be so little information um, about assets and so on. It, it appears from where I'm sitting that, you know, an awful lot of people must be burying their heads in the sand. Um, can you um, provide a bit more insight into why there's so little information and why we're in this situation? I'll, I'll ask him to come in, but I, I think, I mean, I think there's, our sense is that they have got a sense of what they could spend on new vessels and services and upgrades well into the future. Um, I think that the challenge that we that we have, I think, is the sense of which that's then prioritised um, and and captured across across all services and across the whole of the country. So I think it's better in some places than others. So I don't think in some cases it's a complete absence. Um, but 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 for example, um, it, there, there are consequential costs of things like road equivalent tariff, which need to be thought through. There's the immediate and direct subsidy for reducing the fare. Um, and if, but if we take the, the, the reduction in fares that are coming um, uh, to the Northern Isles in 2018, uh, as well as whatever the direct cost of that will be once they've decided on, on the reduction, there are then longer term costs potentially depending on demand and behaviour and other things that have knock-on consequences. And so it's those kinds of costs that, that are, to be fair, difficult to, to pin down exactly, but we think there's more that could be done to, to, uh, to estimate those um, longer into the future. Graham, do you want to? I don't think I would, I would add anything to that. It's, it's to some extent, it's a, it's a work in progress. Uh, there's lots of um, developments planned and underway. Um, the precise costs of those developments will um, become clearer over time. But it's certainly the kind of thing that, you know, as, as part of good financial management, Transport Scotland should be looking at now to at least. Um, estimate the consequences of some of uh, these developments. Mm -hmm. And in terms of what you've seen, does it look like good financial management to you? Yeah, I mean, this this came up actually at the time of the report launch, and, and we don't we aren't critical in any in in the report um, about the way in which you know the the money is spent day to day, and the way in which that's managed, and the way in which that's looked after, and and you know they know where it's gone, they know what it's being spent on. That's not really. The concern. Um, I think it's about that longer-term financial management and planning about the investment that we think is required. Um, genuine question. Um, I think Mr. Beatty mentioned that you know a genuine question about whether this level of increase, this level of investment, is sustainable in in the current environment. Um, and of course, it could be sustainable if government decide that's what they want to prioritise their spending on. But but that needs to be based on we think a, a kind of stronger sense of longer-term planning for the whole of the ferries network and, importantly, what it's designed to achieve. OK. I mean, I appreciate some of the future costs are, are difficult to calculate, but in the report you highlight that, in terms of assets, the condition of around half of the harbours is unknown. So, surely, um, work would have been undertaken to, to get that kind of information. Why is there an absence of information on that? Yeah, I mean, that, that is a great example of, of exactly the kind of thing we think we need to do. Now, again, it's not straightforward because they don't own half the harbours there, uh, as Graham said earlier, in, in different kinds of ownership. Um, but but they are used by mm -hmm. um, Transport Scotland subsidised ferry services. And I think there are examples where um, decisions have been taken about either a new vessel or a new route mm -hmm. and then that's required significant upgrades or changes to, to harbours and I think having a better sense of that up front mm -hmm. about the condition of the asset across the piece which obviously will require lots of collaborative working working in partnership with all with all these um, different owners is an important part of the, the story and that's why we keep banging on a bit about the national plan which is genuinely national which looks at not just the assets that are owned by 
um, or subsidised by Transport Scotland, but actually needs to take account of the full the full range of um, uh, equipment and assets and, and boats that are out there. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to understand that point a little bit better. So, in terms of um, the barriers or the reasons why that kind of audit work hasn't happened in terms of you know the conditions and maintenance, is that because of the ownership structure, or is it because that work's just not been been planned for? Graham, can you? I I I think it's um, it's really just a case of that that work has not been carried out. Um, I I think you know the the creation of Caledonian Maritime Asset Limited um, provided a greater incentive to actually look at you know the condition of their harbours to actually come up mm -hmm. um, with um, a, an estimate of how much upgrading that these harbours require. And um, I think it would be a good thing if that, that principle was extended to those other harbours which uh, CMAL don't own. OK. So if officials are listening today, who is it that needs to get that memo and take that work forward? So um, it's so the ferries team uh, need, need to be looking at that. And to be fair, I think that's exactly kind of some of the things that we, we have a degree of confidence about, that they are beginning to to look at ferries in a more strategic way. So, and, and in a sense, we would we would say the same thing to any public service organisation, which is have a decent asset management plan. Mm -hmm. Know the state of your current assets, know what your priorities are, and know, therefore, what you need to spend uh, and where you need to spend it into the future. Uh, and this is exactly the same, complicated slightly by the fact that they don't own them all. Mm -hmm. um, but, okay. the, but the reality is that um, they do use them, uh, and therefore, it's important that Transport Scotland have a good, clear picture of that. Okay. Um, again, sticking with long-term planning, so I'm looking at um, Case Study 5 on page 49. So, you know, I'm kind of getting the impression that there might be a wish list of, of projects, both relating to, to vessels and also to, to, to harbours. Um, but I, I'm just getting a feeling that a lot of decisions might be on hold, because if you don't really know um, how much investment you require in the harbours, you can't make the decisions about about the vessels. So I wonder if you're able to say to what extent you think there are decisions on hold and are things being kicked into the long grass? I, I don't think we've had a sense of that. No, I don't. I don't think that's the that's the issue. I mean, I think the the case study that we've got in number five is an in, is an interesting case study. That's why we've that's why we've pulled it out as one because because it's a good example of ensuring that the investment decisions are all joined up. So it's one thing to decide on a new route or to decide on a new boat, but then you need to think about what that means for the harbour. And, and, and our sense is that in the past, at times, those decisions haven't been as joined up as they might have been. So you decide to build a longer boat, and then we think, oh, actually, that needs uh, a bigger uh, or, or different or different upgrade to the harbour. So, so I think that's an example where all of that needs to be more joined up, and that's both the case on individual areas, but, but again, looking right across the piece, that's the kind of joined up and strategic thinking that we are looking to encourage. Okay. And as Fraser said earlier, he spoke about the ferries plan being a, a good initiative. You know, it's, it's an attempt to look at the future. Um, what is the current demand on the ferry services? What is the likely future demand? What does that mean in terms of capital investment in new vessels and harbour upgrades and so forth? Um, so that, that's all good stuff. It, it, it's there. Uh, but as we, th we we think now, the next step is to to extend the principle of the ferries plan, which is focused on um, the the Clyde and the Western Isles, uh, to make that an all-encompassing Scotland-wide ferries plan, um, a ferry strategy, which um, um, speaks to and is uh, uh, compliant with uh, the, the overall national transport strategy. Okay. Um, I'm interested to know, did Audit Scotland, did you assess if there's sufficient number of ferries that are designed to withstand adverse weather incidents? Um, we, no, no is the short answer. We didn't. We obviously looked at and report on the number of adverse weather and other relief incidents, but um, I think we've, we've always been pretty clear that we are, it's not our expertise to get into judgments about whether one boat's the right boat or another boat. We, we did hear a lot about that, it has to be said, when we visited communities. A lot of people anecdotally would say that some new boats are, are more or less able to, to berth uh, in some places. Um, I have family members on Rothsey and I hear that a lot um, uh, uh, on, the, on that route. Um, but, but we've not really been able to make a, an assessment of, of the extent to which that's, that's actually the case or not. 
Okay. Um, something else that was flagged up to me when I was speaking to, to other MSPs who are more familiar with uh, ferry services than I am is that, that the booking systems don't track how many people are unable to book a place because uh, ferries are full. Again, is that something that you can confirm? Did you do any work on that? Um, we, we didn't look specifically at that issue, but um, we are aware that the, there have been issues with CalMac and his booking system. And um, uh, again, that was something which many of the island groups that we spoke to raised. Um, I think we can later confirm, but I think doing something about the booking system, mm -hmm. improving the booking system, is one of the 350 commitments. Okay, okay. And I suppose just lastly, um, you know, I think the, the points you've made around um, long term planning are, are quite clear. It seems to be a, a, a recent, a, a recurring theme from other um, Audit Scotland reports. Um, recently, we've looked at NHS workforce planning, self-directed support. Um, you know, would you agree that that is a sort of recurring theme? And again, what's the the, sort of the message that you would like to put out there? Yeah, I think absolutely. And I think colleagues in government are probably fed up with us saying <laughs> it, um, but it's not going to stop us from saying it. Um, because are they listening? Uh, well, yes, I think actually in some in some cases, I think I think they probably are. And to be fair, on this one, um, on, on the ferries, there is a plan that, that is relatively long term. It runs until 2022. It was a 10 year plan. Our, our encouragement, I guess, to Transport Scotland is, is don't wait until 2022 to start writing a new one. I think we need to be looking at that um, soon so that there's no gap between the two. But absolutely, long-term planning has always been important. And given given everything we know about increasing demand and expectation and <coughs> almost certainly reducing finances, um, it seems to me that that kind of long-term planning is more important than ever. So we will, we will keep banging that drum and uh, we are hopeful that we're seeing signs of progress in some places. Just... Last, last point. Um, again, looking at the recommendations that you've made beginning on page six, particularly in terms of long-term strategy, they're very, they're very basic. You know, it's like the nuts and bolts of what you would expect. So I'm a bit concerned that, that this hasn't really been, been covered already. <coughs> what is the risk if these recommendations are not implemented quickly? Um, I won't go over them all, but it's the, the points on page six. Yep. Um, so, so we try to make the recommendations as clear as we possibly can, um, so that they're they're actually actionable. And I think the Transport Scotland have agreed uh, with most of them, um, which is good. Um, I think the, I think the risk is um, not necessarily directly to the services that people will dis will experience day in day out. The risk is that one around sustainability and value for money. Uh, we think that's the kind of key point here, and that's what the, that's why the recommendations start with the thing about long-term strategy, because um, it seems to us that ferries have enjoyed a very significant increase in investment over the last 10 years. Um, we are raising a question as to whether that um, can continue into the future, um, and in order to make those kind of decisions, they need a good long-term plan that's genuinely Scotland-wide that helps prioritise how and where we're going to spend that money. Thank you. Okay, Alex Neil. I've got four questions. Uh, first of all, can I say and ask this as a fan of CalMac, but some people put it around that there is an issue around the cost structure of the company. And, for example, one of the um, allegations is that there are people on salaries around 70 grand a year, £70,000 a year, uh, and only work need to work about 16 weeks a year. Uh, to get that seventy thousand pounds, is that true, or is it a myth? So, so we don't know. Mr. Neil is the short answer to that specific question. Should we not be finding out? Um, well, I think I think what's interesting is that there is a there is a discussion and a debate to be had, not necessarily about those those kinds of numbers, but what we did hear very strongly from communities and from Calmac is that these are very good quality jobs in places where in, in pretty fragile communities. So, so there is a benefit to having you know, well-paid jobs in, in local communities, and CalMac are very clear about that. In fact, one of the things they do evaluate, in, and we mentioned this towards the end of the report, is the amount of money directly that um, CalMac employees bring into local economies, and that's important. The only thing I would say, also say, finally, is, again, I come back to the value for money point. I think when you look at 
when you look at what um, uh, the new contract in North, uh, the Northern Isles Ferry has done in terms of different ways of working and efficiencies, when you look at some of the comparators in Guruk Dunoon, I think there are some important questions to be asked there about efficiency and value for money. So I can't, I genuinely can't comment on the specific stories which we've all heard about how much people are, are paid. I, I do think that um, Transport Scotland and CalMac have a, have a responsibility to demonstrate value for money in everything they're doing. Can I say I agree with you um, that irrespective of sal salary <coughs> level, um, the more of these people who live on the islands, the better for everybody, uh, particularly for the island economy. But there's no evidence that most of them actually live on the islands either. So surely, as the auditors, we, we should be getting to know, I mean, even with the best will in the world, if it is at all remotely true there are people earning £70,000 for a 16-week year, you're not going to tell me, because that's good for the islands, it's uh, an acceptable situation from a public audit point of view. So, no, I'd agree with that, Mr Neil. And if, and if you or anyone else has any specific um, suggestions for us to go and look at, then, of course, we're happy to. Well, I think you should. I think, I think there should be a, a look at the cost structure to, to either put these myths to rest or to find out if it's true. Uh, you know, either way, I think we need to know. So my, I, and I see other people nodding, I think the job of the auditor is to find out. So happy to take that away, Mr Neil. I guess what I would say is um, that in, in the context of this report, which is about the delivery of the, the service overall, um, you know, we're not always going to get into that level of detail. But as I say, if there's a specific concern about those kinds of things, I'm happy to take yeah. that away and look at it. I think, I think we've got to explode the myth or find out if it's true okay. uh, and deal with it in either case. Because, you know, it's, if it's not true, then it's a very unfair slight uh, on CalMac, which in my view is an excellent institution. And it is an institution as far as the people of Scotland are concerned. The second area of questioning I have is just following up on something Monica Lennon said. Um, about and which the convener referred to is this reduction in numbers of passengers uh, which is obviously I think from what Graham said earlier is variable that in the Clyde estuary for example uh, we've had a significant increase in the number of passengers and traffic uh, but that would suggest that perhaps there hasn't in the rest of Scotland given the, the share of total traffic that the Clyde estuary makes up, does that suggest that there's actually been a decline in passenger numbers elsewhere in the network? And do we have an understanding, is this decline in passenger numbers and the overall small increase, is it due to lack of capacity, as Monica referred to, people not being able to get on ferries because they're not booking in time? I know in the Arran ferry now you have to book well in advance of any chance of getting on it. Um, so is there a lack of capacity? Do we need, for example, in Arran, being a good example, do we need actually more service provision uh, to increase the numbers? Or is it lack of demand? Um, so Graham will help me with the numbers. So I think... Overall, we talk about, this is Scotland-wide, a very small increase in passenger numbers, 0.3%. I think in answer to one of the questions there, Graham said that the, the Clyde and Hebridean element of that is actually a 7% increase, Graham. Correct, yes. Uh, paragraph 42 yeah. on page 26 of the report gives a breakdown of um, uh, the, the, the change in uh, passenger numbers by individual uh, Yes. Network. But, but where, where there's actually a static position or indeed a decline in numbers, is that due to a lack of capacity uh, and there's pent up demand that's not being met, or is that due to a fundamental lack of reduction in demand? Do we know? So Do I'm we know? Gonna, I'm going to say I'm not sure we know for sure. I don't. The capacity question is an interesting one because it's very route specific. So over the piece, when you look at all sailings at all times of the year, you would you would argue that. Um, that most uh, ferry services are significantly operating significantly under capacity. There are some that are operating nowhere near full capacity. But as you say, there are some pressure points in terms of route and at particular times of the year, which which causes the problem. So that's so that again is why that targeted investment is really important because you wouldn't want to 
increased yeah. capacity across all everywhere. You need to target that specifically. But we, should, but we should all be trying to, obviously, including Transport Scotland, to get a better understanding, almost route by route, um, you yeah. know, as to why these trains are happening, uh, yeah. to see what we can do about it. I mean, uh, certainly when I worked in industry, if you had a falling demand, one of the first things you would do is number one, find out why, and then secondly, look at ways of generating additional demand yeah. uh, to get better use of the asset. And in some cases, and again, Graham will keep me right here, um, it is the fact that there have been fewer sailings. So it's a, it's a literally just there are fewer sailings. So I yes. think that's the case on mm. in Northern Isles, Northern Isles, Graham. That's that's one yeah. of the reasons for a decrease there. But is that because again, is that uh, those fewer sailings? Is that because of the contractual arrangements, because of lack of capacity, or because of lack of demand? There's a competition from cheap airlines. Again, I don't think I've got an answer for you there, Mr. Right. Neil. But but those are exactly the kind of things that you'd want to unpick and understand and, for sure. I think we need to get a good, and I think Transport Scotland needs to get a good understanding of what lies behind these figures. Yeah. Um, the third area is the economic and social impact of RET. Um, now, I take the point. I think it was Graham that made the point earlier. In, it's perhaps in some areas a bit still a bit premature to get a full economic and social impact assessment. Uh, and there are obviously downsides and upsides to RET. I mean, the, uh, uh, anecdotally, I would say from my own experience of going to Arran that the economy of Arran has never been more successful as a result of RET, but that may be due to other factors as well. So uh, is Transport Scotland planning to carry out an economic, and, or the government, an economic and social impact assessment of RET, and will that include the impact on freight traffic as well as passenger traffic? Okay. I, I, I don't know the answer to that one. Um, I would expect that under the normal circumstances of things that if you're introducing a new service, a new initiative like that, that um, there would, as a matter of course, be some kind of evaluation of the success of that. Uh, initiative uh, a couple of years down the line. Yeah, because to, 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 to get a real assessment of the value for money from RET, and you know, my my view is that it's been highly successful in terms of, and it's, I mean, the whole purpose of it was to help the economy and the social fabric of the island communities. But and my impression is it's an investment well worth making. Uh, but I think we do need evidence that that's the case. So, so we set out in Page 25, Mr. Neil, paragraph 37, 38 and 39, what, what Transport Scotland have done to date, which was to evaluate the pilots, which um, which which did look good, that looked yes. positive. Yep. Um, again, I think there's something about the variability of the impact across the different routes, which yes. is why it's important in order to take, which is why we think is your, your exact point, which is to take that more global assessment of the significant money that's being invested in RET and and the RET variant that will go into Northern Isles next year yep. um, is exactly that kind of evaluation that not only assesses how much it's cost and what it's done for passenger numbers, but then what's the what's the knock-on impact then to local economies. That's, yes. that's the key bit. And that's the, it's that extra link that's missing at the moment. Because I think if we look at this purely from the narrow point of view of an accountancy exercise, uh, I don't think we get the full benefit of the positive aspect of RET, and I think we now need to, to yeah. start looking at that. Because passenger numbers gives you a bit of the story, but you would really want to understand, for example, spend per per head when they're on island. So, yeah. you know, the, the, the makeup of the passengers, if they're, you know, higher spending passengers, and clearly that's better than, than lower spending. So, so it tells you part of the story, but there needs to be a more sophisticated assessment of what the actual economic impact is of, of the numbers trends. Um, uh, once they're actually on island and, and spending their money. Okay. And my final question is, I think uh, despite the very substantial increase in investment in our ferry service, quite rightly so, uh, there is still an issue around the profile, the age profile of the ferries. Um, you know, uh, we still, it seemed to me, particularly in the 80s and 90s, we went through a period where there was an investment starvation and we haven't yet been able to catch up totally with the backlog that's been created as a result of that very lean period in terms of investment. So have you had an opportunity to look at, you know, in 25 years' time, 10 years' time, uh, is the, in the work of CMAL, obviously, it's important in this in terms of raising the capital and so on. 
But um, what, what's the age, is the age profile improving and is it improving fast enough? So I don't know if we've got the specifics of that question. What what Transport Scotland do have is, and I'm going to forget the name of the, the plan, Graham. The that Vessel said. Replacement and Deployment Plan. That's it. Um, thank you. Um, which is designed to do exactly that, I think, is to look ahead to the future and see what, what, what investment is required. Uh, and obviously the government has invested and continues to invest. Uh, we saw the, the launch at Ferguson's this week um, of new... Of new ferries, so so I don't know. The, we can try and find out the, the detail for you in terms of the age, but I think yeah. that is one area where Transport Scotland are are aware of it and are looking ahead to for exactly that reason. I think that would be very useful getting that additional information along with the additional information on the cost structure, in particular, if some of these uh, accusations uh, made about uh, uh, people earning seventy grand for sixteen week years is uh, true. Okay, can I move on to Willie Coffey? Thanks very much, Convener. Uh, only a couple of questions. I think colleagues have pretty well covered quite a lot of the territory here uh, before me. But just on the on the numbers, uh, passenger numbers issue, if you don't mind me just asking one on that. You're taking as your starting point 2007, I think, in your report. Um, and you say that passenger numbers have went up 0.3%. That's foot passengers, I take it, not yeah. cars. Yeah, but um, Transport Scotland's report to us for the committee today suggests that the foot passenger numbers have went up 9% in the last year. Now, that's clearly in the last year, the first year of the RET. So does that mean, basically, that numbers were on decline significantly over the years since 2007 and then, obviously, to spike in the first year of RET? Is that what we're seeing here? And is that reflected in all of the services? Um, can you just try and uh, unpick that? The 0.3% the, the, the increase in passengers over the last 10 years is Scotland-wide numbers. Yeah. Um, if you look at the statistics, um, there has been a significant decrease in the number of passengers travelling on Good at Dunoon. If you look at CalMac, uh, the, over the last 10 years, CalMac passengers have gone up by 6.9% over the piece. Uh, and as you see, uh, the number of CalMAC passengers in 2016-17 in, uh, increased by 9%. Do, do we have a, a kind of year-by-year -year breakdown over that period, Graham? Um, could... I don't think we have it in the report. Uh, we certainly can provide it. If your question, Mr Coffey, was what's the, you know, what's the pattern uh, yeah. over that period, then, then we can certainly, we don't have it in the report, but we can provide that for you, I'm sure. I mean, it's, a, it's such a discrepancy, isn't it, in the two numbers. Yours, uh, Transport Scotland are saying it's 9% up, and yours is 0 0.3, but you're over 10 years. Well, indeed, and, that, and the 9% is just this last year, which, as you say, is the first year of RET equivalent. Right. So, so that okay. may be yeah. the sign of, a, of, a, of, a, of an increasing trend. Um, but I guess it's too early to tell whether it's a trend or whether it's just something that's happened this year. But, okay. but that'll be something we'll want to keep an eye on. Right, OK. Just uh, my other question was just in terms of your recommendations, again, that you've made, do you get the sense that Transport Scotland have kind of embraced and signed up to your recommendations? I got the sense that they hadn't really in the response that they've given the committee. I mean, they're, they're suggesting that they're going to note your comments and we're already making progress and so on. And you yourself, Fraser, said that they don't measure the social and economic impact, but they, in their report, say that they make a significant contribution to the social, cultural and economic impact of the islands and such. So how, how can they say that if they're not measuring it? So, so on the last point, Mr Coffey, that in a sense is our challenge, because that, cause that phrase or similar phrases like it appears in lots of places. And of course, being auditors, we then go and say, well, how are you demonstrating that? And that's where it does get a bit tricky. So, mm -hmm. so that's why we think there's more to be done there. And to be fair, as I mentioned earlier, the policy assessment framework is, is a route that they will start trying to do that. In terms of your, in terms of your core questions, so I'm confident that particularly around um, the longer term strategic planning point, uh, and the minister was at the um, uh, Rural Economy and Connectivity uh, Committee yesterday, where he uh, um, again confirmed that they were committed to doing a longer term strategy, which is very welcome. So I think on that front, our sense from what they've said and from uh, working with colleagues in Transport Scotland that they are they are genuinely committed to that and think that's a helpful recommendation. Being honest, I think that the area around procurement has been a point of contention. I think they um, don't necessarily 
agree uh, with our conclusions, uh, which is you know legitimate. That's fine. That happens sometimes. Um, uh, and as you'll see from their response, they mentioned the fact that they'd won awards for it and other things. Um, so, so uh, having said that, I do think they are already taking steps in terms of procurement, as I said to Mr Kerr earlier, around taking a more strategic approach about learning lessons from this one. Um, so I think there were some specific points we made, particularly around things like the qualifications of, of people on the team, where I think there might be, still be a bit of disagreement. Um, but over the piece, our sense is that they are accepting of the report, accepting of the recommendations, and, and obviously we'll keep an eye on uh, keep an eye on implementation. Mm. I mean, I think you, I mean, you've said that their performance is really good, and we mm. should acknowledge that right across the board. And I think your report is good too, and it, and it offers, let's say, opportunities for improvement that we expect uh, the services to, to embrace. So where, where do you think you, you would expect to see, and what would you expect to see, say, in a year's time, if you're coming back again to report to the committee? It's a frequently asked question here, but how yeah. would you expect to see this kind of performance improvement evidenced for us? So as you say, Mr Coffey, it's not really about the performance of the ferry services themselves per se. There are no doubt there are um, some areas that, that members will be aware of that, that could always improve more and perform better but over the piece that's not really the that's not really the issue it is about that demonstrating value for money and demonstrating the sustainability of it so obviously we'll wait and see what the budget holds in the next few weeks um but it does seem to me that if the, if the trajectory of spend continues to be as it has been for the last 10 years then it's really important that transport scotland are able to demonstrate that that's um, sustainable and value for money because as I said when, when we reported the, when we launched the report you know this is money that could be spent on other things so we need to be clear that the additional um, 100 million pounds uh, that we're now spending um, is is the best way of delivering growth and uh, sustainable growth into the island communities so I think that's our that's our challenge it's not about the quality of the service or the quality of the boats we've all benefited from that it is about that sustainability and value for money point. Okay, thank you for that. Thank you. Bill Bowman. Thank you, convener. Morning. Um, I think again, many of the areas have been covered, and I'll perhaps jump around a little bit. You talk about in your report Transport Scotland all the time. There seems to be a sort of corporate veil of secrecy here. Who are you actually dealing with? Can you name the positions, if not the individuals, that are giving you all these answers that you want to hold responsible? Um, so, <laughs> for just for clarity, no, um, absolutely no way we're meaning to have a veil of secrecy over it, uh, Mr. Bowman. Uh, that's pretty routine practice for us. We tend to name the corporate body because that's what we audit. We don't audit the individuals, but we audit the corporate body. But Graham can give you a sense of the kind of people we've been dealing with. Yeah, of course. Uh, I mean, ultimately, the uh, the chief executive of Transport Scotland is accountable uh, for uh, ferry services. Who uh, is that? Roy Brannan is the chief executive. Uh, there is a director within the senior management team with responsibility for um, ferries uh, by the name of John Nichols. And there is a ferries team uh, beneath that who uh, do the day-to-day -day stuff and report to John. So what was Roy Brennan? Brannan? Sorry. Roy Brannan, yes. Brannan, sorry, I beg his pardon. Brannan. Brannan. You know, I presume you discussed the report with him. We go through the formal clearance process. So every every report we do, uh, we submit to the relevant accountable officer, and the accountable officer writes back, confirming the factual accuracy of the so, report. So, so yeah, we've what done did he process. say when you said it is difficult to determine whether Transport Scotland spending and ferries is value for money? That's pretty damning, isn't it? Well, I think I think their response. Um, his response, I mean. Well, well, his response was is. is it's the corporate response, I guess, but his response is recognising that there's more they could do, and, and I think he would say that they are already doing something about that. And I mentioned earlier the policy assessment framework, which is designed to do just that. So, um, as as is often the case in these reports, there's you know a robust exchange of views about what we think and what they think, um, and it's always very professional. Um, and he, uh, as I say, accepted the factual accuracy of the report. It's important to say though that. The judgments are the order generals, and we don't ask accountable officers to agree or disagree with the judgments. That's not for them to do. What what they're agreeing with is the factual accuracy of the report, and that's what you have in front of you. So um, the response, which I presume you've seen, mm -hmm. the two-page response, which uh, you know, you, you say you got agreement. I mean, in here, I don't really see any agreement, or 
that they note and we may take account of. There's nothing like a plan that says, you know, this has come up before, I think, you know, these are the issues, this is who's responsible, this is how we'll deal with it, this is when we'll deal with it. I mean, that sounds like agreement. This sounds like somebody has put together a, I would say, in my term, pretty pathetic response, just saying how wonderfully well we're doing. And, um, you know, you've maybe got some points and we'll, we'll think about them. So, so I guess it'll be for the committee to decide what you want to do about the response from Transport Scotland to you. Um, and don't get me wrong, Mr. Bowman, I would I would like that response and all responses to be more specific and more uh, and with a better action plan in place. Graham is the auditor um, of Transport Scotland as well for his sins, um, and so Graham, as part of the annual audit process, which as you know happens all the time, uh, will be following up the recommendations in the report. So we have mechanisms in place to make sure that that they are followed up, and, and if and if our sense is that they are they are ignoring the recommendations or they're not implementing them, then then we have that route to report to the Auditor General and then potentially back on to the committee if that's where we get to. Okay, thank you. Can I just ask one or two specifics? Um, there, there was a mention, I think, of the amount of money that um, goes into local communities. Um, I think it's on, is it 119? Towards the end, yeah. 85.8 yeah. million being paid in direct and indirect salaries. What is the actual net cash? Is that the gross salary or is that the employer's total cost of the salary? Because I guess... If that's the equivalent of your quoted salary, by the time you take tax off and that sort of thing, you know, the actual cash going in will be somewhat less. Do we know? Um, we I, I can't answer that today. We'll go back and check the report. Is that their figure then? That's their figure, figure, yes. That's a Calmac figure. Okay. I think also, just jumping around, you, you spoke about market procurement needed for value for money assessment. Um, I think one of you said that. D did we actually have a market procurement? when there was only one bidder? So, so I didn't quite say that, I don't think. I think what I said was if in the absence of going to market for a procurement, you would still expect an organisation to be able to demonstrate the value for money of, of whatever they're doing. So I think that was the point I was, I was trying to make. Um, I think, as I said earlier, Mr Bowman, you would, always, you would always want as competitive a, a tender process as you can. The reality is that this is, you know, there's only going to be so many people that are able to deliver the kind of service that is being uh, delivered across Clyde and Hebridean. Seems there was only uh, one services, and in the end, there was only one because um, the Serco bid was judged to be non-compliant. Um, I think what's therefore important, and in a sense, this is why we keep banging on about the value for money. In a sense, that makes it even more important that Transport Scotland are able to demonstrate value for money. That's why it's really important that why we make the point about the 350 commitments. Um, if anything, I guess our view is that because there was only one compliant bid, it's even more important to, to have all those mechanisms in place than, than if there were two compliant bids, if you, if you see what I mean. So. And just one final point. Does anybody actually look through to the operating efficiency of the, 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 the routes, the vessels? You know, the subsidy, presumably, at the end of the day, reflects... Um, the results of the companies running the, the routes, who, who monitors that they're running them as efficiently as they can? Okay. Um, uh, Transport Scotland have a monitoring responsibility over um, CalMac, uh, but the, 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 the size of the subsidy that has been paid to CalMac is obviously fixed through the contractual arrangements. So um, ultimately, the 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 operational efficiency of CalMac is partly influenced by its thinking about how much subsidy it needs to run those services, and. Um, because it's a competitive procurement ex uh, exercise, CalMag need to think about how efficient its services are to minimise the amount of subsidy that it requires to allow it to win the contract. So we, we try in Appendix 2, Mr Bowman, to set out the different roles and responsibilities because, as I said right at the start, it's, it, it is very, it's a very complex picture how all this works with the various organisations and subsidiaries. So Transport Scotland is responsible for monitoring the performance uh, of the ferry operators and managing the subsidy payments. Now, um, part of that needs to be about how 
so, so that's about monitoring the performance and, and the cost and the subsidies against the contract. Um, I think, as we've said throughout today and, and, and in this report, that, um, that Transport Scotland needs to, would want to assure itself, and this will be important in thinking about the procurement review that's currently ongoing, that they are getting as efficient a uh, service as they possibly can. And we think there's um, more scope in there for uh, more targeted um, monitoring and evaluation of, of the kind of thing you're talking about, the operational efficiencies of it. So it may not have been part of what you're doing now, but is that subject to another review by yourselves in, at some point? Um, well, no, no plans at the moment, but again, through Graham's uh, audit of Transport Scotland as an organisation, that's that's one of the things we would we would want to keep an eye on is how is how they're monitoring the chief's contract, and really importantly, understand the, the minister will be bringing out an interim report on procurement uh, exercise in the next few weeks. So that's going to be really important for Northern Isles and for Dunoon, both of which are are currently um, on hold. And as I mentioned earlier on. It is striking that it would appear that the new contract in the Northern Isles has reduced the subsidy. Part of that is, um, as I said, to do with reductions in uh, sailings and the price of fuel, but some of it is because they've changed the way things are run and, and does appear to be more efficient. I think there's a challenge role there for Transport Scotland and the ferries team being more strategic and managing those three contracts across uh, across the board more strategically to ensure that if there are efficiencies and lessons to be learned in one contract that, that we're able to apply those to others. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, can I just, uh, if there's any help convening just on that last point, say that, uh, I know I'm not meant to do this, but say that um, if Northland get it wrong with the with the freight exporters in Lerwick, that is getting fish, mussels, salmon farming out, £300 million a year, we take them to task. And I'm not sure what happens on the West Coast, but there's a very active... Uh, customer relationship between the operator and the and the uh, uh, and the shipping company in the North Isles, and I just I couldn't speak for the West Coast, but I commend that model to, to maybe to the committee. Two questions, if I may, convene. The first is on Alec Neil's points about RET. A paragraph 40, Mr. McKinley, um, use the Audit Scotland state, as the government did not set clear objectives or targets for RET, it will be difficult to determine, etc., etc., etc. Is there any evidence they've now done that? Because I entirely take your points about how do you assess a policy when the government, this is not a criticism of Transport Scotland, this is the government should have set out what it wanted to do. Um, so the short answer to that is no, not really. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think the view taken. Uh, at a policy level, is this is a good thing to do? Uh, lower, <laughs> so lots of things. Lower yeah. ferry fares. I mean, baby's a good thing to do. Lower ferry fares um, are a, a good thing, and in a sense, that's our central challenge here, which is it says at the back, as I mentioned earlier, the ferries plan says it's set out to do some things, and our simple question is, yeah. well, how do you know whether it's doing yeah. those or not? Okay, fine, thank you. The other one I really wanted to ask about was in Para One Sixteen. Um, you have made some very pertinent observations about future. Um, implications, which I think a number of colleagues already asked about, but in particular, the last bullet point on freight. Uh, freight is fundamental to these services, as, as Mr. McKinley, you and your team very well know, and you point out there that um, freight fare options have been reviewed and discussed since 2014. Is there any suggestion that review might actually come to a conclusion? So you will be better getting that from Transport Scotland, Mr. Scott, but having I've watched tabled PQ after PQ indeed, after PQ. Having, having watched the Minister at the REC committee yesterday, um, there was no timetable given. Uh, he said that obviously he, he's looking for more assurance about the impact of whatever decisions they make. So I, at the moment, there's no, there's no time scale there's no time scale for um, Can I understand your sentence where it says... Um, uh, the aim is to introduce a consistent freight, freight fare structure, which means costs will increase on some routes and decrease in others. Did you mean in that sense across the West Coast or across the whole of the ferry network in, in Scotland? I just wanted to understand what that meant. We can check, but I think that's everything. I think it's everything, yeah. I think but you made a very fair point earlier on mm -hmm. about the complete difference between, uh, you know, Orkney to across the Pendle Firth, Lerwick to Aberdeen, as opposed to the routes that some of my colleagues were describing. Yeah. And is that not material to that freight? Do you, do you understand that, that might be material to that freight fair review? I, I sure do. I mean, we are not at all close to the review, no, Mr. Okay. Scott, so I can't really say much more about it. But I would, I would anticipate that the review will, will take into account all of those factors. And uh, how important, in, in auditing the service, uh, was uh, lots of colleagues have asked about passenger numbers and, and car numbers, but for me, actually, the freight is the most important. Now, Northlink, again, can provide you with reams of statistics about yep. how much. Uh, that's not the case on the West Coast? 
That's correct. So Northlink have, and I think regularly report on yes, do. Uh, freight numbers publicly, but that uh, that information is harder to come So they could provide the, the committee post. with anything the committee wanted in terms of freight changes and so on and so forth, but that wouldn't be the case, would I be correct in thinking with the West Coast? Is that right, Graham? Uh, I think that's basically correct, yeah. Um, um, Northlink in particular are, have a much better handle on the types of freight yeah. that has been carried uh, compared to uh, um, Calmac. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. That's very much, Mr. Scott. Liam Kay. Yeah, just briefly, if I might come back on this value for money point uh, that various members have, uh, have raised. And uh, I'm looking in particular at page 26, uh, where it talks about uh, uh, what seems to me a competing service. And you'll correct me if I'm wrong on this, but uh, it seems to me that between Gurukh and Danoon, you have Argyle Ferries, which is a subsidised service running passenger-only ferries, which have seen a decline of 50% in passenger numbers, alongside an unsubsidised Western Ferry Service, which has seen a passenger increase uh, with cars on it as well, of 1%. So an increase of 1% against a 50% decline. And my understanding, and I can't remember where I read this, so you will correct me if I'm wrong on this, but that the, the Argyle Ferry runs at approximately a 7% capacity. Now, if that's right, I'm sitting here as a taxpayer saying, uh, am I paying for too big a vessel? Uh, am I paying for a duplicate service? Uh, am I paying for too many sailings? Uh, what's going on? And so my question is, uh, there, there doesn't appear to be value for money. So what are Audit Scotland or Transport Scotland or any agency doing to assess, in the case of that particular route and, of course, the wider picture, whether the taxpayer is getting value for money for running, a com subsidising a competing service there. So, um, so that responsibility rests with Transport Scotland um, to do that, I think, first and foremost. And the reason that we um, focus on um, Gurukh Doon a little bit is that it's, it is one of the few where there is a kind of almost, almost a direct comparator. And I say mm -hmm. almost, and I'll explain that in a second, um, because it goes, broadly speaking, um, the same place, but there are some differences. It's a different kind of vessel. It's a different route. Um, but certainly, anecdotally, um, there are uh, you hear a lot about the differences in, in the in the consistency of the service, the, reli the reliability of the services that are provided there. And as you say, the the exhibits we've got um, in in exhibit six are very striking. I would anticipate. Again, don't we're not party to it, but I would anticipate the current review of procurement policy to be thinking about that very carefully because it is one of the few areas where there is already uh, a successful and, and um, sustainable private sector mm. provider, um, which is not the case in most other uh, routes um, across, certainly, and certainly not in the Clyde and Hebridean part of the business. So, so the short answer to your question, Mr Kerr, is that that's exactly the kind of question that Transport Scotland should be asking itself as part of this review. Um, and then when they think about what they're going to do with the, the, the tender for Dunoon, which I understand again from having watched the minister yesterday, they'll be looking to extend the current contract because the review isn't going to be quite finished in time for for the end of that. So, um, so I would anticipate all the questions that you've asked being part of that review. So, just to be absolutely clear, Transport Scotland are going to, as far to, to the best of your knowledge, Transport Scotland will produce that value for money analysis uh, in this review. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't go that far. I think I would. I would love them to, but they should be, uh, and I think they should telling. be in the same way that we say in this report that they should be able to demonstrate the value for money for all the services. I think what's interesting about Guruk Dunoon and why it, why it brings it into sharp focus is there is a closer comparator mm -hmm. um, in a way that doesn't exist anywhere else. So I think it, it, for me, it's the same point, which is about your ability to demonstrate value for money mm -hmm. because of the services that are that run that route uh, or close close together. It does bring it into sharper focus. Thank you. Okay, um, I wonder whether I might just ask one final question. Um, I didn't see anywhere in the report, I might have missed it, an assessment of the procurement of maintenance and repair of our ferries. And the reason I ask is um, a lot of this work used to be done in Scotland. It's now all, as far as I'm aware, done in Liverpool. And I wondered um, whether you saw a process that underpinned that decision. Did we uh, it's not something we looked at as, as part of the report. Sorry, convener, we didn't, we didn't no, look no. at it, we didn't come across it. So. No. That, 
that's fine. It just seems to me an, an unfortunate loss of jobs um, elsewhere. But there you go. Can I thank you both for your evidence this morning? Um, and can I now move the committee into private session? Thank you.